So this is from another study that Dr. O did in uh, Chicago, and uh, it's they, what they did was biopsy heel capillaries from infants with early and late cord clamping. And uh, if you look at the capillary on the left, let me use this one, you can see here this uh, thick endothelium and almost no lumen. This is, in, a, in essence, an inactive capillary. It can't really do any work. And there were more of these in the heels of the babies with early clamping. If you look at this capillary on the right, you'll see a fat, thick lumen. I mean, yes, lumen and a very thin endothelium. And if you look right up here, you can see little fenestrations, which allow for exchange of nutrients. Now, this is an important study, I think, because A, it will never be repeated. It would never get through the IRB today. And B, we can never biopsy brains lungs, hearts, uh, livers, and kidneys, obviously, in babies. But we can, I think we can assume, we know that the heels and the hands are the last places to be perfused on babies. So if these babies have such rich capillaries in their heels, can we assume that they also have them in their brains and their livers and their lungs? Um, I kind of assume that. So. In my career, I've done about 25 expert witness cases for both sides. Um, and um, case one is uh, one of, I mean, case two is one of those cases. Case one was sent to me by an obstetrician uh, shortly after we published our first paper on delayed cord clamping. And he said to me in this paper, I wish I had never cut that baby's cord. Um, the labors are not abnormal. These babies both had heart rates recorded just before they took off the tracings, um, before they took off the monitor because they were getting ready for delivery and thought they might have to do suprapubic pressure. Both babies were also turning their heads at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were large babies. They both had some shoulder dystocia. The head to body time was six to five to 10 minutes. In my case, not um, recorded. The cord was clamped immediately in one, and in my case, there was a nuchal cord which was cut before the baby was delivered. Uh, low pH, and you see here in, in baby um, two that the pH actually dropped over the first hour of life, even though the baby had excellent supportive care. These babies uh, had a systole 23 minutes in one and 18 minutes in the other before the heartbeat. Um, the 18 minute, they had had all the drugs. 18 minute baby started, uh, his heart started beating after a bolus of saline. They both seized within the first two hours. They both had low hematocrits, which went down later. Baby number one died at two months of age. Baby number two, when I got the case, was um, nine years old. He was able to walk but not run, and he was in the fourth grade, but he was reading at a first grade le level. Both families won lots and lots of money. Unfortunately, they needed it. But So <clears throat> we developed an asystole hypothesis, and it says that the infant is squeezed tightly, the way it works, this infant is squeezed tightly in the birth canal. The blood becomes more sequestered in the placenta. The birth canal pressure works like an anti-shock garment so that you don't see the cha any changes on the tracing. At birth, there's a sudden release of pressure, uh, which results in extreme hypovolemic shock. The heart will stop if the lack of perfusion is severe, just like that, as it did in both of those babies, because it was beating five to six minutes before. At least 30% of the blood volume or more is left in the placenta. So clamping that cord immediately may result in these negative outcomes. This is a baby that someone sent me a picture of, 10 pounds, 6 ounces. Um, this was right after she was delivered. You can see the pallor of her skin. Her face is blue from um, her delay in delivery. But look at that umbilical cord. And um, think about what's in it. So I told you about the second stage squeeze. I just, it's pressure from the tight fit. Arteries continue to move blood from the baby to the placenta. 
The soft wall umbilical vein is easily occluded. There's a net transfer of blood away from the baby. There's very few changes on the monitor. Occasionally you see a little tachycardia, but there's nothing on that monitor to indicate. The anti-shark garments, the pressure for, like anti, that acts like an anti-shark garment helps to maintain blood pressure, heart rate, and circulation. It transfers the blood from the peripheral circulation to the central circulation. circulation. And they estimate that anti-shark garments provide um, 20 to 50 millimeters of pressure to the lower body. They're used in Africa for women with uh, severe postpartum hemorrhage when they have to transport them to try to keep them alive. However, then at birth, there's a sudden release of the pressure as the baby comes out and that pressure is missing. It, that opens up peripheral circulation, reduces the central circulation, drops blood pressure, drops blood flow to the heart, and the heart can stop beating. Immediate clamping of the cord would leave this infant with severe hypovolemia, which can lead to inflammation. And Raja, Rajik has told us that inflammation can be caused by blood loss alone. No reperfusion is needed, no infection is necessary, and it results in a baby's brain on fire. In this study, um, 2002, they were people working for the DOD, and they were interested in the effects of a moderate hemorrhage. So they removed 25% of the blood volume from seven-week-old rat pups. They used no, no other fluids, and at three hours of age, after the hemorrhage, they sacrificed some of the rats, and found increased gene expression, ILB1 and IL10, uh, and in the lungs, a three to 15 fold increase in these uh, same um, gene expressions for these cytokines. Their conclusion was that inflammatory cytokine cascade was induced by non-lethal fixed volume hemorrhage without subsequent fluid resuscitation. That begins and leads to the inflammatory cascade, which reduces its reduced perfusion in various organs, stimulates upregulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, leading to an intracellular junction leak and microcirculatory injury, loss of autoregulation in the target organ. Within three days, there's invasions of leukocytes, edema, hemorrhage, and fibrin in the endothelial cells. This progressive damage continues over days and weeks and the target organs are then damaged. Hankins published this uh, study, 2002, showing the multiple organs that fail when a baby has HIE. And you can see from the high percentages that they have to have more than one, and some more than two of these organs fa fail. <clears throat> and the only thing that is at all plausible that could hap have that happen over and over in so many babies is um, poor perfusion, I believe. When we look at children who were resuscitated at birth and look at their cognitive outcome at eight years of age, um, I did a study to determine whether these infants who received resuscitation had a reduced IQ. And by age eight, the IQ was lower. Without symptoms of HIE, the odds ratio was 1.6. And with symptoms, it was um, over six. And looking at teenage outcomes after being born at term with moderate neonatal encephaly, uh, Lindstrom found that 71% of the subjects had cognitive dysfunctions, 18% had hearing impairment, and most of these dysfunctions interfered with daily life. Now, UE, you know they've changed the adult um, CPR to um, chest compressions only to maintain perfusion to the heart and brain. And they did this because in the pig model, they found that the survival went up from 13 to 80% when they gave continuous compressions. And you can see here that um, if, you stop, um, if you stop the compressions, you kind of have to go back and start over again to get the, the pressure up high enough. Um, so I feel that blood volume is critical to adequately perfuse and protect the newborn hearts and brains, just as they were in that.